So today we're going to talk about something called electromagnetic induction. In a way, it's going to kind of take all the concepts that we've covered, whether it was from electric fields, electric forces, magnetic fields, or magnetic forces. It's going to take all those concepts and kind of throw them all together into one big concept, kind of a new situation we're dealing with today. Let's get going. So we're going to start with a quick review on magnetic fields just to start today. In particular, I'm going to focus this on the first, second, and third left-hand rules. Then we'll learn about electromagnetic induction. Basically, just to make it simple right off the top, basically this is where you use a magnet, or at least a magnetic field, to create the flow of electricity. So we are inducing, the word induction, the in, we are inducing uh, some electricity here through using a magnet. Uh, we'll also look at something called Lenz's law, which is how induced magnetic fields behave just in general. That's going to be quite a weird one, but we'll get to it. And then, of course, we'll have some time for practice. Uh, I will have a homework assignment that I'm going to be giving you today as well, uh, but we'll worry about that, of course, at the end of the lesson. Here we go. So this is not in our notes. This would have been from a previous time. Uh, I want to remind you that an electric current flowing through a conductor produces a magnetic field. So if you have a straight conducting wire and there's a magnetic uh, or sorry, an electric current going through that straight conducting wire, it's going to generate a rotating magnetic field. This can be modeled using the first left hand rule, which as this diagram shows, you just kind of curl your fingers and you have your thumb pointed the other way. Your thumb would represent the direction of your electric current and your fingers represent the direction that your magnetic field is going. Now we use our left hand for uh, actual electric current, so the flow of electrons. Keep in mind that people in certain other industries, like in uh, electrician work even, and even some physicists, if I'm going to be honest here, um, they use their right hand for something called conventional current. That's where you would assume that the positive particles are moving, which, as we know, they don't. The, the negative particles are the ones that move. Electrons are what flow in electricity. So in my opinion, it makes a lot more sense to use a left hand. But either way, you know, the first left hand rule, whether you use your left or your right hand, your thumb represents your current, your fingers represent the direction of the magnetic field. Now, the second left-hand rule was almost the exact same thing, except the magnetic field and the direction of electron flow just swap. This is where you had a coil of wire, like a coil of a conducting wire uh, wrapped around something. Your fingers, this time, your co coiled and curled fingers will represent the direction of your electron flow, and your thumb will represent the direction of a magnetic field line. So this was really, really useful when you wanted a more predictable and, uh, and more behaving magnet to use. Uh, basically, if you just wrap a coil of wire and then shoot some electricity through it, it'll turn that coil of wire and whatever's inside of it into a bar magnet. This is the, the entire idea behind how an electromagnet would work. Moving on, third left-hand rule. This one my, uh, is my personal favorite, to be honest. Third left-hand rule relates the current, an external magnetic field, and a produced force. Basically, if you have some sort of an electric current or even just a single um, charged particle moving through a, a magnetic field, you're going to induce a magnetic force to deflect that charged motion. So in this simple example in this picture here, we have a negative particle. We can assume it's an electron by the looks of it. It is moving perpendicular to a magnetic field, so not in the same parallel direction. It is moving perpendicular to it. It will experience a deflection. This thing is going to be shot downwards. Uh, so again, you use kind of a flat hand to do this. You make an L shape with your fingers and your thumb. Uh, your fingers represent the direction of your magnetic field. Your thumb represents the, the movement of your negative particle. And then your palm is pushing in the direction of the force. Um, again, you can use your right hand for this as well. Your right hand, of course, would just be your thumb pointed the other way. So in other words, the flow of positive particles, which again, I think is always just silly, but it works the same way, one way or another. Now, here's what's actually in our notes for today. Magnetic fields, Faraday and Henry, these are two different scientists, Michael Faraday and Joseph, I believe, Henry. Um, they independently discovered that a magnetic field could produce an electric current. So these are the guys who kind of, you know, put this idea together. If you have a magnetic field, it can produce an electric current. If you have an electric current, it can produce a magnetic field. Basically, electricity and magnetism, two sides of a, a same coin sort of idea, right? One way to induce an electric current in a conductor is to move a conducting rod, so like a, some rod that's going to conduct electricity, uh, through a magnetic field. This produces a current in the rod, causing electrons to flow and gather at one end of the rod, 
If the rod is placed within a circuit, as shown below, I'll show you in the next slide, the rod will actually complete the circuit and act as the current in the circuit. This flow of electrons is called induced current. So this is where seemingly out of nothing, other than movement, you are actually creating an electric current. So the picture to kind of show us this, it's very blurry, but hopefully you get the idea. This is in your notes. Um, what it shows is it shows some sort of current, condu uh, cu current conducting wire put inside of a magnetic field. This magnetic field is pointed downwards in this picture, of course. Now, what they're doing with this rod is they're moving it kind of towards the right here. And upon doing so, because it's moving perpendicular to the magnetic field, an electric current is going to be induced. Now, in this picture, it shows the current going this way, right? Now, what's a little bit strange here is this is actually a diagram using conventional current. So in other words, in order to model this, you would have to use your right hand. Your right hand with your finger and your thumb kind of making, uh, you know, a a perpendicular L kind of shape, uh, you have to point your right hand fingers downwards and your palm should be facing the left side here so that the induced conventional current is going this way. Now you might be wondering, why are we pointing our palm towards this side? Why aren't we pointing our palm towards where the speed is going here? So where we're actually pushing our wire. The reason for this is when you do this, it's actually creating a bit of a pushback uh, you might remember Newton's third law, uh, way back from physics 20, where every action has an equal but opposite reaction. Um, that's kind of what's going on here. It, it's not a full explanation. It's not even the best explanation, to be honest. It actually is better explained by something called Lenz's law. But we'll get into that in just a second. I just want you to know, just for later notice, that this diagram is using conventional current, um, not uh, the current we would use in physics, uh, physics 30 here. If you wanted that, you, of course, would just have changed the direction of this arrow to that way instead, but just an FYI. We'll explain this a little later on. If this is confusing, you're like, hey, what's going on? Don't worry about it. We'll talk about it when we get to Lenz's law in just a moment. Now, electromagnetic induction. Uh, it's the production of an electric current in a conductor by changing the presence of an external magnetic field. So this is a similar thing to what we just looked at on the last slide where we're moving a conducting wire. You could also move your magnet and get a similar effect where you're actually generating an electric current. So the easiest way of thinking about this is if you had a coil of wire, if you took a magnet and started moving it in and out of that coil of wire, you're going to induce an electric current within that coil of wire. Now we're really gonna break this down in the next couple of days. So today we're not gonna go super in depth with it, but the bottom line is when you induce a current, you're also inducing an opposing magnetic field, uh, which is therefore pushing the current through. But we'll get into that in a little bit here. So Faraday, one of those scientists from before, he discovered that a galvanometer, basically something that measures a current, uh, set up as shown below, detected a current when the switch was opened or closed. What I want you to see in this diagram here is there is a battery with a switch and it's hooked up to this coil of wire here. Now this coil of wire is actually insulated. It's a little hard to read on this, but it's insulated with cotton and calico. So in other words, it's not gonna influence the iron ring that it's wrapped around, um, but this, coil here is not actually connected to this other coil here. There's a little bit of distance between the two and they're not actually touching. They're insulated apart from one another. They're not actually touching. However, what uh, Faraday noticed was when he opened or closed this switch, uh, going from one to the other, uh, all of a sudden this galvanometer on this circuit, not physically connected to the rest of this, would start to move one way or another. What this kind of told him, just to kind of paraphrase what this paragraph is saying, uh, what this kind of told him was if you are inducing a current through a wire, which we know is going to also induce a magnetic field, that magnetic field is going to influence this other one, which will then induce a momentary current through this. Now, just because this has a sustained current through it doesn't mean that this one's going to get a sustained current through it. What seems to affect it is a sudden change. If all of a sudden we go from having nothing to having something, that change causes an induced current to happen through here. Therefore, what Faraday kind of put together here was it's not the presence of a magnetic field that matters, it's the presence of a changing magnetic field that matters. Going back to this picture from before, just having a magnet sitting in this coil of wire isn't going to produce electricity. What you need to do is you need to change the presence of that external magnetic field. You need to move the magnet in and outside of that coil of wire in order for a current to be generated. As soon as you stop moving the magnet, that current is also going to stop. 
So another experiment to prove electromagnetic induction is to move a magnet in and out of the air solenoid. That's what I was just talking about, in and out of a coil of wire that is connected to a galvanometer, just so you can test to see whether or not there actually is a current. Uh, an induced current is produced, but only when the magnet is moving relative to the solenoid. Oh, and I just should remind you, a solenoid is a, a fancy word for a coil of wire, basically, like an electromagnet, right? Uh, also, the deflection when the magnet is moving into the solenoid is opposite that when the magnet is moving out. So you get an alternating current. You get your current moving back and forth, back and forth. That's called an AC current, right? As opposed to direct current DC, which is where it is always going in the same direction consistently. So this brings us into that Lenz's law that I was referring to just a few minutes ago. Lenz's law states the direction of a magnetically induced current is such as to oppose the cause of the current. I know that that definition is not in your notes, at least not uh, in 2022 here when we're, when we're recording this, of course. So you might want to pause the video here and just make sure you get that into your notes. OK, so to continue on again, the direction of a magnetically induced current is such as to oppose the cause of the current. These pictures here, they spell it out perfectly. I really like these pictures here. Basically, what this is showing is if you have a magnet, we're just going to deal with the north end because that's where, uh, of course, magnetic field lines come out of. If you have a magnet and you're pushing it into a coil of wire, that's what that little ring is supposed to represent. What's going to happen is it's going to induce uh, a magnetic field that opposes the cause of this. So when you put the magnet in, you're bringing it in. It's almost like the coil of wire is going, no, 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 stop right there. It makes a, uh, a magnetic field that opposes that. So it also makes a north end pointing on this side of the coil of wire as if to, re like, to refuse the direction of that magnet. So there actually will, you'll feel like a little bit of resistance. In other words, you'll have to do some work to overcome that. That's another important thing to understand. Uh, you'll, you'll have to do a little bit of work to go over this induced opposition. Right now, if we're going to use our, I believe, I guess it would be our second left hand rule and use our thumb to point in the direction of this induced magnetic field. So you might even want to do this right now. Hold up your left hand with your thumb pointed to the right and your, your fingers curled over. Uh, with your fingers curled over, you're going to see that our electric current is going to be going up and over this coil of wire. So it's going to be looping around that way. On the other hand, if you had your magnet and now you were moving it out of the coil of wire or away from the coil of wire, it will also try to oppose that. So it's like the coil of wire doesn't know what it wants. It doesn't want the magnet to go in. It doesn't want the magnet to go out. So as you're removing it, notice these lines are pointed this way. That would imply that this is like a southern end now. Uh, the southern end, of course, is going to try to attract the northern end. So as you're pulling it out, it's going to try to resist that as well. So you have to do work to overcome that. And because now that our magnetic field lines are pointed to the left, once again, you can hold up your left hand, this time with your thumb pointed to the left and your fingers curled towards you, you're going to see that your electric current is coming out this way now, right? The bottom line is when you have a magnet that is moving through a coil of wire or going in, going out, doesn't matter what, if there's a changing motion of a magnetic field, there is going to be an induced magnetic field created and therefore an induced current created that will oppose that initial change. Really weird concept. But again, if you just think of there being your permanent magnetic field, so your actual bar magnet, and the one that's being induced to try to oppose what's happening here, that's what's going on. Uh, anyway, moving on. Let's see some more here. So Lenz's law can be thought of as an extension of the conservation of energy because the electrical energy cannot be created from nothing. Without this opposing force, no work would be put into the system. Ha ha, see, that's where I was saying the word work there, right? No work would be put into the system, yet electric electrical energy would be produced. In other words, we have to have these opposing forces. There has to be something opposing what you're doing in the first place for you to overcome so that work, in other words, a change in energy, is being done. You're changing energy from one form to another. Therefore, electrical energy is being produced. So the force put into the system, in other words, work done to overcome the opposing force, is what is converted into electrical energy. That is the source of the energy that turns uh, the, the current going, right? So again, bottom line is all you need to know. A magnet entering or leaving a coil of wire will induce a magnetic field to oppose that. So if you're putting, uh, go back to the other one here, if we're putting a magnet into a coil of wire, 
basically the northern end, if that's what's coming in, it's going to create a north end trying to push it away. On the other hand, if you're trying to remove a magnet from a coil of wire, there's going to be a south end trying to attract the magnet back in. It wants to oppose what you're doing. I'm really beating this to death, but it is important that we understand it. That's why I'm really, really stressing it. So in a similar way, back to that context from earlier, where we had that weird like rod that was in that weird magnetic field situation. Uh, in a similar way, a conducting rod moving through a magnetic field will experience a force that opposes the motion of the rod. That is, the two magnetic fields will oppose each other. So finally, using Lenz's law, I can give you a little bit better of an explanation of that picture that we saw earlier. This one I like a little bit more, but unfortunately this one also uses conventional current. What I want you to see here is we have this wire here, this kind of purple kind of colored wire, uh, and we're moving it to the right. So you're pushing on it to the right. You can even consider this like an applied force, pushing it to the right. Well, the, because this is going perpendicular to a magnetic field, it's gonna wanna oppose that. So there's going to be an induced magnetic force trying to push it back. Now, because there's a force here, you're gonna to wanna to use your third rule, right? Uh, and this time we're gonna use right hand rule because that's what this picture uses. If you wanna use your, your left hand, uh, just the third rule where we have our fingers pointed out, by all means, go for it. You're just gonna see the direction's a little different. Um, but I'll use my right hand here. I'm gonna take my right hand and I'm gonna make sure my palm faces the left side here. Now, my fingers on my right hand, my fingers on my right hand are gonna represent my, uh, my magnetic field lines. The magnetic field lines are all these little X's that you see in the background here. Remember, uh, I know we didn't deal with this in physics 20, but in physics 30, this is gonna come around a lot more often. If you see an X, that means it's going into the page. If you see a little dot, that means it's coming out of the page. I always said, think of it like an arrow, right? If an arrow is being fired towards you, you're gonna see the dot, you're gonna see this little point. So it's coming out of the page towards you. If an arrow is being fired, fired away from you, so into your page, you're gonna be seeing the feathers on the end of it. So you're gonna see like this little X here. Anyway, back to the diagram down here. Just need to explain that, of course. My palm is gonna be facing the left. My fingers are gonna be pointing straight into the pages because, uh, because of this, this X here. So my fingers are pointed into the page. My palm is pointed to the left. My thumb is pointing up this way. So my thumb is going here and that is gonna complete a circle going this way or a circuit rather going this way um, using conventional current. Now, I don't like conventional current. It kind of hurts me to even use my right hand in general here. So if you wanted to switch this around, let me get rid of my arrows here. If you wanted to switch this around and use your left hand, your fingers still need to point into the page and your palm still needs to point towards the left. So I'm gonna have to kind of flip my hand around. It's a little bit uncomfortable actually doing it when I'm facing my screen. If you wanna try it too, go for it. Point your fingers at the screen, point your palm towards the left. You're gonna notice your thumb is pointing down. If you're like me, your hand's gonna be kind of backwards and it's gonna be kind of uncomfortable right now, but your thumb pointing down, that is actually your true electron flow. It's gonna be going that way through the system instead. As long as you keep track of what kind of uh, current you're using, you're good. In this course, I don't use conventional current, so please don't do that either. Don't even say, oh, I use conventional current. No, don't. In this course, I want you to use electric current, so make sure you're using your left hand for these. Anyway, moving on. Uh, oh, and just in case you're wondering, this was one of the best pictures I could find, and it just so happened to use conventional current. That's why I'm showing it. There's not very many good pictures that use the electric current. Anyway, moving aside from that. So generators, an electric generator works opposite to an electric motor. You might remember a couple of days ago, we were talking about how a motor works. If you put electricity through, it induces a magnetic field. The magnetic field causes a, a coil of wire to start to rotate. Boom, you got rotational motion. If you're wondering how that works, go back and read the notes from earlier. Uh, but basically a generator, it works opposite to that. A motor uses electricity to produce motion. A generator uses motion to produce electricity. Motion, by the way, we would call that mechanical energy. Uh, a generator is set up similar to a DC motor, but the loop of wire is mechanically forced to rotate, which induces a current in the loop. To be energy efficient, a loop can be forced to rotate using natural forces such as water or wind. So basically, if you wanted to think of like a, a wind turbine, the wind turbine inside where the, the turbine is spinning there, you basically have a loop of wire that is spinning between some sort of a magnetic structure. So it could even just be as simple as spinning between two magnets. Now this is hooked up of course to some other power supply so it'll take, it'll take it away. But what happens when you rotate a loop of wire through a magnetic field, as we've discovered today, uh, an electric current is generated. If you wanted to use water instead, like in a hydroelectric plant, 
by all means, you're just using uh, water to spin some sort of turbine. And the turbine is just a loop of wire spinning between some magnets that's creating electricity. A nuclear power plant works similar to that as well. They use steam basically to go and move a bunch of turbines. That's about it. So give an example of a generator, you can say whatever you want. I just threw in there, I know this is right in our note package, but hydroelectric turbine, you could say wind turbine, you could say nuclear turbine, whatever you wanted. Because this setup does not have a commutator, remember a commutator was like a split ring, uh, the induced current will change direction with each rotation. This is an alternating current. The commutator again was where we had like a split in our ring here, so that as it rotated or as we use electricity in here, like attached to this, and it caused it to rotate in a motor, we wanted the motor always to be spinning in the same direction. Um, in this case, because mechanical energy, this one's actually a turn crank here, because mechanical energy will always be turning in that motion, having a split ring doesn't really do us much use. Uh, so you're gonna be getting AC voltage from this because as it goes over, there's gonna come a point where all of a sudden it switches polarity uh, and it goes from there. Don't worry about that too much, but basically these kind of generators would produce an AC voltage. You go from having it go one way to another way, back and forth, back and forth. It's actually a good thing. Pretty much anything you have plugged into the wall is using AC voltage. DC voltage is really, really mostly just used in things that have batteries. Woo, wow, we actually made it. And in really, really good time. It was just over 20 minutes long. So uh, for practice, uh, what I want you to do is work on the worksheet in our note package, or if you would prefer, you can also work on the homework assignment. Now I need to apologize. It says it's due Friday, March 20th. I forgot to change that. I don't know off the top of my head when this thing is due. It's not gonna be due at any point this week, I believe. Ooh, maybe I don't wanna eat my words. Tell you what, I'll tell you when the due, when the due date is another time. Uh, as a matter of fact, by the time you're watching this, I probably even have it written on uh, the classroom calendar. Of course, if you're just someone who's a casual observer watching this on YouTube, obviously you don't have, you don't have to worry about that. You're free, awesome, perfect. But anyway, your work's cut out for you. If you have any questions, please make sure you reach out and ask. Best of luck.